All right, let's go ahead and get to the message in. Today's message titled, Prayer and Supplication with Thanksgiving. And that does come from uh, Philippians chapter 4. And this is this and another verse that we'll talk about tonight, uh, kind of together, to me is like the secret that's not really a secret about finding peace with, with God. It's not a secret. It's written out there for everybody to know, out there for people to preach and all. But a lot of times in the situations that we go through, we forget about that stuff. And we'll talk a little bit about a few words there, like we see the word prayer. We, we just did that right now. Hopefully it started touching into supplication. A little, Just a real quick thing, and we'll get into it more later. So we, we probably find the, the, my brothers and sisters in Christ that are here tonight and all that, you know, we probably pray multiple times every day. You know, I, I don't I don't know exactly for sure but you know i know that you you have a walk with the lord and you know you know your you know god's word and and you have a prayer life and um so a lot of times our prayer is out of our our one just the regular prayer asking god for things communicating with god and they're they're all good but when you get the supplication and you know i'm thinking about sadie right now it kind of goes, it's, you, there's a stronger word than just prayer. Supplication is a form of prayer, but it comes with a more earnest heart. There's a greater burden that's put on you. And it's not just a prayer out of your want, but it comes a prayer out of your need. And, and it can be more heartfelt. And then the other word that we'll, that we'll look at a little bit later on is thanksgiving. Uh, so it's prayer and supplication with thanksgiving and the difference that Thanksgiving makes. So, and we're going to get into it right now. So what really the Thanksgiving does is it changes your perspective. It changes your view on things. You ever notice there's like, you know, maybe two people can go through the same thing and they have two totally different attitudes about it when they go through it. And one person handles it much better because of the attitude that they have with it. And the other person, it's, it's, it hurt. even when they're relatively small things for some people, every little thing is, it seems to be like a great burden to them. And it's all in the perspective. I'm not going to tell you what, it, what city this is, but can anybody, I don't know if you can see it from that far away, but anybody want to guess what city that might be? I won't tell you during here. I don't want to, you know, we're being, it's in California. Close, very close. Location-wise, very close. Anyway, you probably can figure it out from there. So that's the sa- those two pictures are of the same city. One doesn't look too bad, you know, from, from that perspective. But the other one, and oh, they get way worse than that. They get way worse than that picture on the right. It's, it, you would hardly believe it's the United States of America with some of the pictures you can get from, from, from here. But uh, the perspective that you have on things matters. And, and these are, you know, there, there's real things involved with this, but this is just to point out that our visual perspective can make a difference. You can think of someone who's on a mountaintop, the perspective they have, how they can see very well, and somebody who's in a valley or even in a, 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 a depression in the earth or, or whatever, where they have very little sight and all that. And that's a, a picture, though, of how we see things sometimes spiritually or see things without our eyes. You know, we, we, talk, we talk about the perspective that we have. We use that word perspective, not just for things that we see with our eyes, but the way that we understand things and the way we can put things together and all that. And it really matters. So I'm going to read Philippians in uh, chapter four, Philippians verses one through nine. I'll just read that those nine verses all the way through, and then we'll kind of backtrack a little bit. It says in verse one, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Iodius and I beseech uh, Sintyche. I'm sorry if I say those wrong. They, they, won't be, they won't be mad. That they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers whose names are written in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. 
And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So looking back at the first verses in chapter four again, I highlighted some words. I know you probably already know, but who's, who's Paul writing to? And, and if you say the Philippians, yes, you'll get some credit, partial credit for that. But how would you describe these people he's writing to? I, I, I just heard a little mumbling over on this side. Just by reading some of those highlighted words, you'd say these people are probably friends of Paul's. I'll go with that. They're, they're brothers and sisters in Christ they're, and, and friends. It's true because he, he does mention friends in, in earlier chapter chapters and um, fellow workers, fellow laborers. Uh, you know, they're, they're, you know, they got that yoke on them. They're, they're laboring. They're hauling a load and all that kind of stuff. And uh, also their fellow Christians and a key part that I've highlighted there, whose names are written in the book of life. And we'll look closer on that as well. And the joy that they can receive by knowing Christ as their savior. And, he, and he's encouraging them to rejoice in, in all things. So yes, they're, they're his friends. And um, looking on, uh, going back to Philippians chapter one, I'm looking at 12 through 14, and I have two, uh, two colors for the highlight, yellow and green. So what I intend, intended is that the yellow kind of be things that some people might look at as negative. And then the green highlight is how Paul spins it to be, or I don't, I don't want to use that word spins it to be, but he, he shows it to be, he sees it with that perspective of it being a positive thing. So let's go ahead and read, uh, read these few verses from Philippians chapter one, starting in verse 12. It says, but I would ye should understand brethren, and then I have highlighted in yellow, the things which happened unto me. A lot of things happened unto Paul, but right now he's writing from a Roman prison not a great place to be. So that's, that's in yellow. Have fallen out rather, and then in green, unto the furtherance of the gospel. So he's saying, yeah, all these things are happening to me, but they're happening unto me for the furtherance of the gospel. That's a good attitude. And then verse 13 in yellow, so that my bonds, he's in chains, he's in bonds. That could be negative. And then he goes on in green, in Christ are manifest in all the palace, and in all other places. So he's saying, yeah, I'm in prison. I'm locked up. I'm in these chains. But word of that goes out through the whole palace and other places all around this whole area. So this is, is uh, the church, church at Philippi, which is in the Macedonia area. So it's becoming known that this Man Paul, who's a great man, right? And even today, but in that time too, a great man. And word is out that he's in prison for the cause of Christ and it's emboldening people. And he goes on in verse 14. And many of my brethren in the Lord, and he has in green, waxing confident, growing in their confidence by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So Paul goes to prison. He's in prison, standing up for the cause of Christ, and it emboldens other people who know Christ to speak 
the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and even bringing themselves into potential danger, but they're emboldened. And Paul's showing the imprisonment that he has is, is furthering the cause of Christ. Now, how's that for a good perspective on this situation right there? How often do are we able to do that? I, I'm going to give Brother Bill some credit. Um, he's been through a lot of surgeries. Still got one coming up and maybe more after that. Who knows? But I think it might have been the one for, I'm just saying, I don't know. We don't know. But but I think it might have been the one for your stomach and the, you know, a lot, lot of serious stuff in that. Bill was talking about the good that came out of that and how it was able to help him through his experience to have a better understanding of other people that are going through other things, other suffering and stuff like that. And that is a perspective that comes by pr practice and choice. The more you practice it and make it your choice, the more it becomes natural and all that. But we can go through things and still be thankful to God. And Paul's setting this up for chapter four. And, and uh, we're, we're in Philippians one right now. We started off in chapter four, but he works his way up to that, showing the things that he's going through and how it's actually for good. And actually, he, he can get some blessings out of it now himself. So this is our, our, our Apostle Paul here from his viewpoint. You know, on the left, he's in bonds. And on the right, that, of course, that's not the Apostle Paul. These are uh -huh. just pictures, I think. And, and uh, on the right is someone uh, preaching the gospel. So his imprisonment encouraged others to speak up out of fear, but still spoke up with everything that's going on around them. And they preached the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and it made a difference. So his imprisonment was actually working out for good that he can see, and he was focusing on that, on that good. And he could still be thankful in his bonds. That's a hard thing. So he didn't see himself as stuck between a rock and a hard place like this poor car finds itself right now. But instead, he sees it as a place of unique opportunity. So we go through a lot of things in our life, and these can be unique opportunities that we can go through so that somehow glory can go to God but it's going to take us having the right attitude and even being able to go through. It's not a natural thing and it's not the natural man or the natural woman that can go that when they're experiencing hardships, big trials, big tribulations can still see some potential good in it and can still have Thanksgiving. And we're going to get more into Thanksgiving because it's kind of a, it kind of works off your, your Thanksgiving gives you a different perspective. And when you purposefully get a different perspective on it, trying to see the good, it increases your appreciation or your Thanksgiving. And they kind of go back and forth. If the more you work at it, the more that can happen where you could say, even in your bad, even things that we don't see a lot of good at it, try to. And we just read Philippians chapter four, and he had that big list of things to think on. Try, try to find the good things, and that's going to change your appreciation. Now, real quickly on the word appreciation. We say it all the time. Someone does it. Oh, I appreciate that. Often we don't really give it a thought. What do we mean when we say the word I appreciate it? We kind of use it as a placeholder for thank you. But appreciation, so if, if you invest $100 in something, you might ask, what's the, re, what's the rate of appreciation typically on that investment? And someone might say it's about 10% annually. So after a year, you get 10% of that $100 added to the $100 that you started with, which makes you have 110. That $100 investment appreciated, it grew. You, you kind of get that? So... When someone does something for you, big or little, you really can appreciate it. Not just saying it, and, and, and I think a lot of you do. 
But maybe think about it on the next time you say the word, I appreciate it. That means the thing that you've done for me, I'm seeing it from the perspective where I'm adding value to that and making it a bigger thing for me. I'm appreciating the thing that you've done for me. And when you appreciate, truly appreciate something that somebody done for you or that God's done for you, you increase the, you, at least uh, relatively increase the value of that because you see it. There's times you could do things for maybe someone who has everything and, and you, know, you do something for them, eh, you know, they hardly care. Or you could do whatever for somebody and they feel like that's, they deserve it anyway and all that. They're not appreciating that. And because they, they actually depreciate it, where it lowers the value of the thing that you're doing for them, and they see it as a lesser thing. It's, it's a great deal when you can have the attitude of thanksgiving and appreciate the things that you're given because they'll mean more to you. Attitude is important in life. So here we go with Paul, back in Philippians chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. He says, What then? Notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I there, therein, he's showing you the good side of the things that are going on right now. All this stuff, Christ is still being preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and I will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be life or by death. Whether in, in, Well, let me just go to the next slide. You kind of know where this one's going. And this is, be, you know, we showed that car that was stuck between a really big rock in a hard place. Paul stuck between two beautiful places from his perspective. And he says, for me to live, if I don't die, if I don't get executed, if I am released from this prison or even being in this prison, there's gain through Christ. And he already explained all that, so I won't have to go through that all over again. The works that are being done by the bonds that he was in that Roman's prison good is coming out of it, good is happening for the cause of Christ because of it, and he says, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So now let's talk about what gain is there. Well, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord for those who know Christ as their Savior and Lord. So he's saying in verse 22, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I want not. He's like, which one should I choose, to live or to die? Because if I live, it's for Christ. And if I die, it's gain. I'll be with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So if I'm living here, Christ is glorified. If I, if I die physically, I'll be with the Lord in heaven. Hmm. Which do I want to do? Which do I prefer, I should say? He's not going to, he's not making the choice. He's just saying, you know, he's just talking about which one would I really prefer? Verse 23 he says, for I am in a strait between two. So, you know, I'm stuck between two things. Having a desire to depart, again, that's to be with the Lord in heaven and to be with Christ, which is far better for him, right? For him personally. But, in verse 24, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh, that means to continue to live in this body, is more needful for you. That's what he's telling his people. He goes, I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know which one would, would be better. I know it'd be great to be with the Lord, but while I'm down here, I'm, I'm preaching Christ. Works are being done. And he's, he's a leader. He's a teacher. And he goes, it would be better for you if I'm here. And it's not out of conceit. You know, he's, he's the apostle Paul. And, and, um, that's not a bad spot to be in. Now, most people in that Roman prison weren't thinking that way. They were thinking, oh, what is it going to take for me to get out of here? I don't even, I just, and they might want to kill themselves. They might want to do anything, but they have a totally different perspective. 
going through the same thing. Actually, Paul's going through probably more because he's got all kinds of stuff on his mind and all kinds of responsibilities, you know, that he has. So now for the secret of peace. Well, it's not really a secret. You can know it. And we've already read it in Philippians chapter 4, but we'll go over it. But before we get into that in more depth, let's do first things first. And this isn't just for the people here. This is for the people listening as well. Before we get into the secret of peace with the Lord that comes from people who know, for people who know the Lord, let's first ask, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? And we've just got a few quick slides to go through that, and then we'll get back into Philippians chapter 4. Well, in Philipp, I should say I got one highlight in, in Philippians chapter 4 um, in verse 3, and it's whose names are in the book of life. Is your name in the book of life? What does it take for your name to get put into the book of life? When you know Christ as your Savior, we're going to go through some things here. Your soul is sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. That's what we have today. Walking through this world, our soul is sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit of God guides us. It directs us. Sometimes we can ignore it and fight against it, but it's there with us all the time, separating our soul from our body. And that we're, our, he, he saved us, and then he sealed our soul, not our bodies, with the Holy Spirit of God. So that one day, when God calls the Holy Spirit out, we're going with him. Anyway, in Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 12, it says that we should be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Listen to the order here. First trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So you heard the word of truth, you believed the word of truth, and you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of God. Salvation, saved. And then in verse 14, this is security, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So like when you buy a house, you might, you might uh, pay an earnest fee and maybe it's 1% of the price of the house. You pay that and if you renege on the contract for no valid reason that was stipulated, then you lose your earnest money. So it's kind of like, I hate to bring it down to pool, billiards or pool, but when, when you play pool, you say, I'll bet you 20 bucks on this next game. The things that you pro probably didn't think you were going to learn tonight. Uh, but, you know, when you're going to bet $20 in a game of pool, you want to know, does that person have $20? So what, what would you say to that person so that you know he has $20? Show me the money. Okay, that sounds like a movie. But you just might say, put your money on the table. And then, okay, and then you play, play for it. And then you can, so that, that's, you know that the person's serious. Otherwise, oh, I was just kidding. We're, I wasn't really playing for money. No, you show me the money, put your money on the table, or whatever like that. Well, God is saying right here, his word is good enough. But to really drive home his point and how serious he is about, about salvation and about the security, he's saying that the Holy Spirit is that earnest. And then it says the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession. So until Christ comes back and calls us out of here, we got the Holy Spirit of God sealing us. And, and uh, that's, good, that's good security. And then also, your name is written in the book of life when you come to know Christ as your Savior. In Revelations chapter 20, it depends on um, which book you're in or which books you're referring to, whether it's a happy passage of scripture to read or a scary passage of scripture to read, but let's, let's, let's read it. I, and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. So again, imagine a stack of books, more than one. Books were opened, and then an, and let's say on this side, and another book was opened, just one book. 
which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, if you know Christ as your Savior and Lord, this is not your judgment. This is the judgment of the dead. This is the judgment of the lost. And it almost seems like a legal proceeding where he's, he's about to condemn them. Well, they're condemned already, but he's making final judgment. And he's like, let's look in these books that have all your works, all your acts and everything you've done. Guilty, 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 guilty. Just going through a list. You're guilty of all this. And then this is the Lamb's book of life which when you come to know Christ as your Savior and Lord, your name is written in that book. And whatever those other books have to say, you're covered by the blood of our Lord, Je or, or your sins are washed away by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and your name's written in the Lamb Book of Life. You wouldn't be at this judgment. But he's showing them their acts fall short. Their works fall short and their name is not written in the book of life. That's the judgment of the dead. So let's read on. And the sea, in verse 13, and the sea, that's the sea of humanity, all the people. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works, not written in the Lamb's book of life. In verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life. There, there's the key right there, verse, verse 15. The other books were just showing them they're guilty. Ver, but the, if their name's not written in the Lamb's book of life, that's really what matters. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Not good. But... If you know Christ as your Savior, you become a child of God. In Romans chapter 8, the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And I like that word, A-R-E, are the children of God. Not one day we will be the children of God, but if you know Christ as your Savior and Lord today, you are a child of God adopted into his family. And in verse 17, this almost sounds too good to even be fair. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. How can that be fair? But that's what we get. And, and if so, and then back to the suffering. If so, that we suffer with them, that we may be also glorified together. And then on the last one, and there's many other things. I just picked a few. When you come to know Christ as your Savior and Lord, you have the promise of eternal life. And, and going back to good old John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And 17 and 18, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And you, there, let me just talk, talk real quickly about a couple words. In verse 16, um, there's the word should. If you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. He died on the cross for everybody, but not everybody chooses him. And then in, in verse um, 17, same thing. He, he sent his son into, not, he didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. Not that what he did may or may not be good enough. That's not what it's saying. It's, he died on the cross for everybody, but again, not everybody chooses him. If you choose him, you will be saved. But he died on the cross for everybody, that everybody might be saved. That, that makes sense? Verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. All right, let's get back to, to the secret that is not a secret. It's written down, but let's talk about it. And actually, verses 6 and 8, I think, kind of go together for me. We've already read these, but we'll look at them a little bit closer. It says, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Now let's look at verse 6 a little closer. But Be careful for nothing. Don't worry. Don't worry about things. You don't have to... And, and we can fall into worry at times, 
We're human. Don't stay there because you don't have to. Is it hard? I'm sure it is. You know, a lot of times King David comes into mind in the pit of miry clay, the hopeless situation that he felt, but then he got to see God work and get him out of that and put his feet on solid ground, on a rock, and all those kind of things. It says, be careful for nothing. It doesn't mean don't be cautious about anything. No, it means don't worry about things. It says, but in every, so the word but means instead. It says, don't worry about everything or anything, but instead in everything by prayer. We talked a little bit about prayer. Prayer, when we talk to God and we ask things of God, and supplication, which is a, a stronger level of prayer where it's more earnest, we're going through hardships, we really need God. I kind of think about it like Peter walking on the water, Lord, save me, real short prayer. I don't know if he had a whole lot of time for Thanksgiving, but there was a lot of supplication in that prayer. He called out and God reached, reached down and Jesus, who is God, reached out and uh, pulled him up. So that's a higher level of prayer, that supplication. And then with thanksgiving, because it changes your perspective on things. And it's what we're told to do. Jesus gave thanks all the time when he split bread. Um, he gave thanks that God hears him. He gave thanks, you know, all the time. Jesus was giving thanks to God the Father. And it's the example that we have is to give thanks. But for all the commandments that God gives us or all the directives that God gives us, all the direction that God gives us is not for us to have a heavy burden. It's for our good. All the things that God has us to do when we do them, whether you know the Lord or not, you just do his directives. Life's going to be better for you. All the things that God has for us to do are for our own good. And when we learn to have the spirit of thanksgiving, it changes our perspective on things, helps us to appreciate the things that we have, and it helps us to speak to God more earnestly, knowing that he's a good God. He wants to do good things for us, and we come to him with prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. Part of the secret that's not a secret in verse 7 and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, whether it makes sense or not to the world, it probably won't. It makes sense because God said it. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And then verse 8, we've already read this and it goes with it. So how, how do we learn or how can we become more thankful in these times of prayer and supplication, he tells us, again, part of, the, part of, I guess, the bigger secret, that's not a secret. In verse 8, he said, we think on those things that are good. That helps us to be thankful. We think on the things that are negative, that just destroys us. We think on the things that are good, it edifies us and helps us to handle the situations that we're in. And God can miraculously intervene if he chooses but we do the things that he already directs us in his word it's going to be for our good and it's going to help us through those situations even if it doesn't change the situation that we're in we might be able to see it from a different perspective and we might be able to have appreciation even in times where it's hard to find but so here's the help that here's the advice that he's given us finally brethren who uh Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and value, and if there be any praise, think on these things. He kind of gave us the secret right there, you know, verses six through eight. We pray to God, we, we, we ask for supplication to God, and we do that with thanksgiving. And to help us with that thanksgiving, we do the things that we just read here in, in verse 8. And in verse 9, it says, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So all that is the secret that's not a secret to having peace in this world, even through the times that don't seem very peaceful. 
And then this is the, this is basically the last slide, and it's just kind of recapping a little bit what we've already been saying, uh, talking about the Thanksgiving part, prayer and supplication with Thanksgiving. Your your perspective can change your appreciation. You can appreciate things better by just having a different perspective on something, and your appreciation. When you do appreciate that thing, when you do show thanksgiving for that thing, it can change your perspective. It's, 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 it's just almost like you get the flywheel going and you know it's just and then you build up momentum from that. But that's the heart that the Lord wants us to have in the things and we can rely on God. And as, a, as most of you have been a parent or are a parent, you know, isn't it a lot easier to do things to a thankful child than to one who doesn't appreciate anything you do for them. You might do for both and to some degree, but the one that shows Thanksgiving and, and your friends and your coworkers and all that kind of stuff that show Thanksgiving, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, you, you don't, it's not so bad at helping that person out. You know, it, it's a good thing. It's the right attitude to have, and that's the attitude that we, sh we should have. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for what a great God that you are, Lord. You give us everything, Lord. All the things that you have for us are for our good, Lord, and your, and your glory. Lord, uh, we just love you. We love your word. We love the direction that you give us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to appreciate it even more. Help us, Lord, to have the, the right perspective, Lord, on things and to, and to see the spiritual in things more than just the physical. And Lord, help us, Lord, to to aim for heavenly things, Lord, and to store up our treasures in heaven, Lord. And Lord, I pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen, and God bless you.